Uh, good morning. Good good evening, everybody. My name is Paul Trio from SEMI. Um, my boss, Tom Salmon, is is unable to to be here uh, today or at the symposium, so I'll be uh, filling in for for his spot. So um, I'd like to welcome everybody to um, Group Two. Um, we'll start off with the uh, the automotive uh, update uh, with Rich, uh, followed by MEMS and sensors. Uh, followed by SIP and module, uh, and then we'll have the supply chain, and then we'll close with the power, uh, and then we'll have the uh, the uh, cross twig discussions. Okay, so my name is Rich Rice. I'm with uh, ASE and uh, uh, involved with uh, marketing and technology promotion. And uh, for the last uh, uh, year and a half or so, I've been working with uh, Ermi Ray as a uh, as a co-chair on our automotive twig. Um, she recruited me, and unfortunately, uh, uh, she's going to be stepping down uh, because her, her job function no longer really focuses on automotive, so I will be reaching out to, um, to others, um, probably starting with the list of the existing uh, contributors to our chapter to, uh, to uh, take a, a co-chair role. But we just want, I just want to thank Ermi so much for uh, all the heavy lifting she did um, over, the, uh, over the months and years. Uh, this is a, a snapshot of our contributors uh, from various different places from uh, US, uh, Europe. Um, and I just want to do a special uh, shout out and thanks to uh, Klaus Pressel. Uh, he did the uh, peer review. Um, I think. Uh, he gave us tons of good inputs. Um, we have probably a lot of work to do going forward with this, but uh, Klaus was, uh, he really went above and beyond in supporting us. And uh, I really, really appreciate that. I think one thing that Klaus made me, uh, or that uh, was hammered home in his peer review is that the challenge of automotive suppliers are really to integrate all these diverse uh, technologies and all of them have specific requirements and that's a huge challenge uh, for an automaker. Obviously it's a huge challenge for us just putting together something much more simple, which is uh, a chapter of the development on, on the automotive front. So anyway, our chapter is organized into uh, five sections, uh, connectivity and communications, the processor roadmap, uh, we get into sensors, uh, functional safety and reliability, and then uh, lastly, the uh, electronic powertrain challenges. Um, and just looking at this overall, um, automotive is a very high volume growth market for semiconductor these days. Uh, it took a dip due to COVID, um, and then it came back, and there wasn't enough even capacity to uh, support their existing demand. And so we're in a real supply situation with them now. But I think the uh, uh, going forward, there's going to be a lot of growth in automotive. Uh, the two major focus areas are in the areas of electronic powertrain and autonomous driving. And uh, I will cover uh, some of those areas going forward. I think uh, there's um, very specific requirements to automotive on impacts and changes on sensors or LIDAR, radar, and camera as it relates to autonomous driving. And of course, the electrification challenges um, are driving a lot of uh, high voltage management requirements. Uh, so the, the first mega trend I, I just want to point out very quickly is electrification. And uh, EV adoption has, uh, has accelerated even through this downturn we saw through 2020. Um, where uh, electric and uh, uh, various different hybrid type of drive cars uh, grew even in a, in a time in 2020 when the business was going down and going forward, I think not only is the global electronic or electric vehicle sales going to uh, grow at a huge uh, kager, but the, uh, the bomb that's associated with that uh, will also increase. So we are seeing uh, possibility for a lot of growth. The other mega trend is uh, autonomy and uh, driven by things like uh, uh, not only safety, but uh, ride sharing and um, a lot of new applications going forward. 
Uh, this really drives processors and the sensors that are going that are going to be used in that and also uh, autonomy really drives up the bomb uh, bill of materials for semiconductor content especially when you start looking at uh, level four and level five vehicles on our uh, in our chapter on the automotive processor roadmap uh, i'd say and primarily driven by infotainment and adas the content or the uh, excuse me the, the package uh, used for that is typically just a single die package today with either wire bond or flip chip but we will see as we go forward in the years that uh, heterogeneous integration is going to be prevalent with multi-chip as well as uh, SIP type of solutions going forward and I think our major change uh, or our minor change excuse me on this particular roadmap has to do with the silicon node because we've noticed that uh, there's been announcements of uh, not only down to 14, but even 10 and 7 nanometer uh, devices now being designed into automotive applications. On the sensing front, as I mentioned, it's uh, what we're looking at uh, is really driven by the uh, autonomous cars. Uh, every one of these um, different types of sensors, camera, radar, LIDAR, ultrasound, they all have different strengths and weaknesses. Uh, we try to cover some of these. Uh, we uh, not been able to cover camera yet, but it's expected for the next revision in 2021. On the radar front, we have a chapter update that's been completed for this current release in 2020. And the on the LIDAR chapter, we uh, had some modifications in edit uh, that were also included in the 2020 release. Uh, on the reliability front, um, I'd say that uh, uh, the key point of this particular chapter really has to do with uh, prognostics and health management. And, you know, as our, as our author of this portion would say, there's five destinations of methodology research, methodology research which really looks at the methods for improving uh, reliability and ultimately safety. And all of these things uh, you can see on the chart are involved with that, uh, including uh, enhancing FMEA, uh, getting more data, uh, performing data fusion for all of these uh, different uh, diverse types of sensors, and then uh, creating digital twins for, uh, for simulating the, uh, the system and making a virtual system. So all of these areas are, uh, are areas of research in the reliability front. Uh, lastly, on the electrification front, uh, we see that the primary impact would be on batteries, but we don't uh, have much semiconductor development, uh, at least that we can identify uh, associated with the battery itself. So what we're looking at are uh, things like uh, enhancements of uh, various different power modules up to uh, 100 kilowatts or more specifically used for inverters and motor drives. Uh, these are our potentials for cross twig collaboration, power integrations, uh, which is a big one. Uh, some of these we haven't engaged with yet on the area of security, and we need to, as well as uh, these other fronts. So lastly, I, I highlighted a number of these things in our 2020 revision. Uh, we did refresh market information um, and uh, updated a number of these areas that I mentioned. and. Uh, as far as I understand, uh, our revision uh, will be online imminently after uh, Paul finishes the uh, editing. So with that, I thank you. Uh, uh, so our, our next uh, uh, speaker is gonna be uh, Shafi on the Memson sensors. Shafi, whenever you're ready, take it away. Yep, thank you, Paul. Um, uh, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Shafi Sayed. Uh, I am from Analog Devices. Uh, but uh, the work that uh, I'm presenting today here is uh, for outside of ADI, it has nothing to do with what I do at ADI. Uh, it's all pretty competitive and, uh, uh, and uh, I'm here to give an update of our technical working group. So I'm a co-chair of this group. Uh, Mary Ann, uh, who is not able to make today, uh, is the one who has been leading the uh, 2020 effort uh, and I thank her for taking the leadership role in our team. Um, 
in addition to Marianne and myself, uh, we also have uh, uh, other members uh, uh, from Letty, uh, Binghamton University, a uh, couple of other uh, faculty uh, uh, from DLO, uh, who's a material supplier. Uh, Bill also participates uh, uh, quite uh, regularly in our uh, technical working group. Uh, I would like to give a little shout out to anybody who would like to join our working group because we are looking for uh, so volunteers who can participate and have a little broader spectrum of MEMS and sensors. So in terms of our objective, uh, uh, our, our key, key area of our focus has been uh, uh, looking outwards. So when we talk about MEMS and sensors packaging, uh, our technical group uh, decided uh, way early that we are really focusing on uh, we are going to focus on taking MEMS and sensors that they have today as a silicon and see what we need to do outwards. We are really not focusing on taking MEMS and sensors and saying what we need to do inwards inside the component. Uh, so based on that, the goal, uh, what we have is uh, the challenges in the path of integration, um, we are driven by you know, uh, primarily application driven and I'll, I'll allude to that, uh, that, that point in a minute. And, the, the goal coming for coming in the future years would be to look free forwards. Uh, I'll explain in a minute uh, what I really mean by that. Um, so in terms of uh, chapter statuses, um, in uh, uh, 2020, we actually have come up with the draft and editorial. Uh, uh, and right now it's in a peer review and, and we'll go to Paul too. Uh, so we expect that that will get published soon. Uh, what we are doing right now, and we have initiated this only recently is we started collaborating across, across the TWGs to see uh, how we can interact and how we can relate to them. Um, uh, and towards the end of this year, what we plan is combine the our foundational stuff that we have done in 2020, combine that with the TW inputs from cross-functional groups and publish the update uh, by the end of the year. So uh, I would like to spend probably just two, three minutes, uh, and I will be going a little faster in the first few slides, because this is a, re re a recap of what uh, we have been presenting in the last uh, couple of uh, sessions or a couple of uh, meetings for HIR. Uh, and the reason I'm presenting this background is just to set a stage so that we can have a little broader conversations uh, uh, in the second half of the presentation. So when you talk about MEMS and sensors in general, uh, this is quite different than the classical digital domain, uh, the digital HIR, which is for, uh, density and uh, density driven, photolithography driven. Uh, sensors are basically interact with the real world, the analog world. And the analog world is the physics or the phenomena that are there in the analog world are quite different. So the stuff that you use or the packaging that you use or the assembly challenges you use for motion sensing, acoustics, which is basically sound, chemistry, magnetics, they're quite different. There is hardly a common theme or there's no common denominator across these different type of sensors. And that's what the biggest challenge is when we talk about uh, sensors roadmap. Uh, each, each individual sensor itself is a roadmap. Uh, but what we are trying to do is see if we can combine these factor and create a, some kind of a common denominator or at least a classification uh, where we can try to figure out how we take that and integrate up the signal chain. So for the first few years, we have been focusing on inertial MEMS and this year we intend to expand to photonics or optical or maybe electrochemistry. So what do I mean by uh, signal chain? So if you look at how, how uh, sensors or where sensors are located in a, in, in a whole signal chain, sensors are right at the front because that has to interact with the real world. And once you sensor senses the actual world, a physical phenomena and digitizes it, converts it to the electronic signal, and then that signal gets processed, it gets passed on. So if you take the today's world, current state of art in sensors, what the industry has done, many companies have done is, they have taken the actual sensor silicon or the cells, uh, a sensing portion of the silicon, whether it's silicon or whether it's some, sometimes it's just optics, um, and put a very first phase, which is taking those signals and converting them to electronics they have made an ASIC and sensing in a very small component level packaging. They have digitized those signals. And the common approach they've taken is using mature technologies like you know, organic based substrates and multiple chips together. Here are a few, few pictures there. So this is a classic first step, taking the sensing, motion sensing and taking the ASIC, combining in a small component. And that's the general trend. The question is how we take the sensors that we have 
combined at the first two steps and combined with interpretation and communications. That's what the edge computing is. That's what the, that's what the uh, sensor hub uh, uh, direction is. So the question is, um, how do we take these different sensing silicons so far, different sensors? Because they each individually has its own microfabrication technologies. For example, if you take the chemistry, right? It uses a, piece of a, chemist, a chemical sensors. It uses a silicon, but it has an additional protein or a chemistry inside those uh, uh, assays that actually has to interact with the real world. How do you take that and combine with the ASIC or combine with an RF chip or combine with an antenna or a power source? That's the challenge that we have. Because in the beginning, the sensing in inputs have different processes. How do you take that and combine with our classical traditional silicon? And that's what creates a problem or that's what creates an issue. Uh, and that's the challenge. Uh, so, so what we have, we have done is after looking at the different application domains, what the MEM sensor teams have uh, uh, basically see and observe is there's a path, a diverging path where, where uh, the mobile and the healthcare segment uh, is driven by a certain set of rules and certain set of constraints. And the autonomous driving, basically automotive, industrial and aerospace, they are driving in a different set of uh, direction in terms of performance, in terms of how they architect the system. Uh, uh, and, uh, and if you look at uh, uh, this chart, this chart kind of uh, summarizes uh, what we think uh, is required in each individual domain. So if you think about mobile, uh, uh, in this chart, you can see in this uh, 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 vertical column, there are applications, and there's a set of uh, columns here, which is the current state of art. So if you take mobile, this is the traditional packaging that we are using today. And as we move forward in what, five to 10 years, this is what we see, uh, these new areas coming up and the type of packaging and uh, uh, integrated approach that we'll need to take to be able to meet the needs in this domain, in the mobile and consumer open. So here's a classic example where a simple example is the sensors that we use uh, are very thick. And as you saw in mobile and consumer, sensors need to go thinner. Can we even do that? That's what the team thinks. And the research would be how to make that happen. As of today, there are many physical fundamental challenges. You cannot uh, uh, cross that barrier. Uh, same thing with the EMI shielding, the space constraint thing, how you provide space shielding between a MEM sensor and RF communication. And as you go down this chart, uh, and this will be part of our write-up, uh, let's take example automotive. Uh, traditionally, they have been using large body, simple lead frame based packages. And as we go into these new domains uh, of uh, 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 autonomous driving, condition monitoring, noise cancellation, adaptive headlights, SIP based modules will become more prominent. That's what we are seeing. What we are seeing is the traditional lead frame packaging are no longer able to meet those needs. So the question is, how can we design or how can we come up with the material set or, 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 or integration architecture that will give us a SIP module for automotive? And same goes for the auto, uh, aerospace and defense. Um, now, in 2021, the objective for us is build upon the foundations that we have built in, meaning we have established initial, uh, initial sensors, what are the common themes, what are the technology areas that we need to look at. And now this year, we're gonna interact and talk to uh, the cross teams, the different teams of like automotive, uh, security, uh, packaging materials, because those are the ones that drive our development, our challenges. So we are gonna to talk to them this year and try to collaborate uh, and, and see how we can converge towards uh, uh, some ideas. Sure. Thank you very much, Shafi. Okay, so our, our next uh, uh, presenter is gonna be Eric and he's gonna be presenting on the SIP and module. Uh, so what we're trying to do in the SIP and modules chapter uh, is uh, to put together that classic three leaf clover coming from the applications and the components supporting that and the technology and make this one whole thing. Um, and uh, in order to do that, first of all, we tried to uh, adhere a little bit to the definition of an SIP, uh, which we took from the, from the semi, uh, which is uh, an SIP refers to a package, mostly standardized package with multiple dies inside plus the integrated passives. 
and blah, 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 surface, typically surface-mounted. We have since seen that's about a, a trend of, of the past five years or so, that more and more uh, of our partner companies are looking into higher levels of integration, mostly looking into 3D integration in board, in package, or already at the component level. Um, and uh, that needs to be uh, considered. And in order to uh, basically uh, align this also with the heterogeneous integration a graph you see here, which is part of the European uh, strategic research and innovation agenda, uh, how to bring the single chips, as we see here, so right now, the, or the MEMS and the optical chips, even the system on chip, into more uh, uh, more density and more package functionalities uh, like this, this kind of system and package. And in order to address that, uh, classification came up uh, with the idea, well, let's start from the, from the application, from the use cases which will derive the functionalities you see here in the content, um, meaning the components. We have to merge them via interconnects. We have to protect them via encapsulation. We have to present them in, in a way as a part of a packaging concept, as well as a packaging type. And if you take a look to this, you will find that these three here, they can form a packaging toolbox, which I will focus right now in my talk, because that defines uh, the roadmap uh, we may see for the manufacturers uh, and also for the all the interfaces to the uh, um, to the other stakeholders. Um, so that zip toolbox. Uh, what you see here is uh, that from the point of view of interconnect and encapsulation, clearly we see still as a workhorse, and it will remain a workhorse for a while to come. Uh, the the wire bonding, whether it's single die, whether it's stack die. We see flip chip, high density flip chip interconnects. We see the package on package approach. And that comes with a challenge that we will see more and more contacts. So that trend is not broken. You will see thinner chips for thinner stacks, which brings up problems of warpage uh, and also the IO arrangement of that. Uh, on the other hand, we see also that new technologies are emerging, uh, which do not rely on either single point or multi point connections, but bringing together the components and interconnecting them in one go, interconnect by electroplate or collective wiring. So embedding of thin chips into the electric layers, passive components together with them, even of embedding standard SMD components, for especially for low volume uh, manufacturing amounts, they can benefit from that technology. But this requires from the package side uh, to come up also uh, with a better lines and space density. So you cannot cope here with 150 micron lines in space, but you would eventually go down to two micron lines in space as depicted here. The remaining dielectric thickness is increased, decreasing, which brings up uh, isolation issues. Uh, Multi-material challenges uh, with respect to problems in warpage, uh, in reliability, in electromagnetic compatibility from layer to layer. So lots of issues to be addressed here, uh, even from the interconnect and the encapsulation side. Uh, if you now take a look to the various, uh, the various uh, packaging architectures we have seen before, and thank you here uh, for, the, for, the, uh, for the group one to come up with that. We have this side by side. Uh, we have uh, the stacked folded approach. Uh, here depicted by a chip stack uh, with, uh, uh, with dual side uh, contacts. Uh, we have this kind of embedding structures as indicated right now. And we have uh, uh, the uh, more recent advancements with respect to fan out uh, integration. Uh, right now, most of these are done on wafer level with single chip, uh, but advents are there for going from SIP on panel levels. So really uh, an 18 by 24 inches uh, of dimensions. We have actually the tool set available to do that, um, which is, for example, reconstituted wafer through silicon vias, micro bumps, wafer thinning, and so on and so on. Uh, jumping further on uh, to how do we present these uh, integrated devices uh, to, uh, to the customers, basically, once again, to the application. So this is the trend we have seen in the past, which is mostly driven by the application-driven differentiation. So, Every, every, every new application we see called for, well, let's get a different package. Uh, obviously, because with thousand package types vari variants right now, this cannot go on forever. And so platform technologies uh, with this uh, SIP will have to address that uh, and uh, only provide adoptions. So what we see right now, when you look at the motherboard, you have a gazillion of different uh, of gazillion, gazillion of different functionalities, but the core technology remains the same. Likely will happen here uh, in our SIP uh, world as well. Uh, 
SIP toolbox that comes also with innate innovations. So for example, if you take a look to uh, what, this, what this is about, you cannot just embed those functionalities into an SIP, but you can add shielding. Uh, you can add mechanical assembly structures. You can add uh, via embedding, you can even add, uh, add those micro channels we discussed before for thermal management. You can add antennas. So that means that the package itself becomes a functional element of uh, what you are presenting to the outer world. It's not anymore just a passive carrier, but it will be a fully functional part of the device. Uh, I quoted here the new boy in the block. It's not anymore that new. Uh, I think DARPA had said, has issued the program call in 2014. Uh, this is the, the chiplet as, a use, as, as an SIP use case. So the original idea of DARPA with, with, the, uh, uh, with the IP building blocks uh, has turned uh, to the uh, integration of, of uh, single die functionalities in a very high, den very dense uh, arrangement. Uh, we have seen this from NVIDIA and AMD recently in the, uh, in the, in the presentations uh, that uh, um, this is also a little bit uh, shifted towards uh, the, uh, uh, towards the, um, uh, the, the, uh, the board level. Uh, but notwithstanding, uh, this is a, a clearly a SIP use case with all the issues of the, of the package architecture inside of how to arrange the contacts, so how to arrange the interconnects. And uh, Mr. Schaff has given us a very good insight uh, on how we might tackle that in the future. Um, bring us to how, what do we have to, to keep up with uh, in, the, in the upcoming future? So clearly one challenge we have to face is uh, that the materials, they need to cope with the challenges we see with the SIP evolve, uh, evolution. So new materials, especially for high frequency, the material interaction, the thermal mismatch, thermal conductivity will become a dominating factor uh, here uh, for, the, for the SIP implementation. On the assembly side, uh, we need to think about the technology diversity because as you have seen just before, uh, sensors are not just one kind of a thing. Uh, we need to deal with these kind of, uh, uh, of, of multi, multi functionalities we see here. Uh, we have to deal with the shrinking pitch. We have to deal with non-soldered components, so non-solderable components even. Uh, and uh, uh, we have to, uh, to check also on test requirements, uh, as we have uh, uh, indicated here, the self-testing, so the built-in self-testing uh, on the component on the SIP and are giving that uh, kind of information to the outside world. Um, I skipped a little bit the cost side, which is clear for everyone. Uh, cost is, has to be maintained. Uh, the customer requirements, so these are the driving factors with respect to reliability and the application specific needs. Uh, and uh, let me just leave, uh, leave some words with the co-design. Uh, here was a very nice paper here during ECTC. It always pays to visit that Congress. Uh, that uh, a, a company has worked on uh, running that entire cycle. So from the uh, from the from the chip conception to the package into to the, to the package integration to the full system, trying to get that throughout the entire value chain up to the PCB. It was challenging. So despite the fact that you have uh, that you have people who have deliberately working on that pattern, uh, you have to deal with with a multitude of tools. Uh, no interfaces provided so far. So co-design is a super critical aspect uh, we are facing uh, for making a, a, a wide adoption of SIP useful. Aside, uh, alongside with that is the standardization requirements, uh, but this is clear, the better standardization you have with tests, with footprint, with dimensions and so on, the better we uh, will be able to roll that out into the large, uh, um, into the large volumes. Uh, last slide, sorry. Um, okay. Here now the uh, the uh, the, the uh, uh, slide synopsis on what will be the most imminent challenges. Uh, and you can see here those marked in red have been identified uh, as those which require uh, industry's uh, highest attention for the time being. So that will happen within the next five years or so. Uh, when you don't take a closer look to these, uh, you will miss your opportunity. Midterm attention and uh, where though no immediate action uh, is, is foreseen from the partners right now, may change for sure. Um, what remains for the, for the tweak here, for the SIP tweak uh, for the 2021 period, clearly refining the quantitative details. You will see in the document that a number of uh, uh, those issues have been addressed also in numbers and, uh, and the respective metrics, uh, they need to be, uh, to be put on the most actual status. 
uh, we need to strengthen the cross trick relationship. So this is what we are about here. And clearly assess also new and emerging developments, for example, like quantum technology, like photonic uh, integrated computing. So that's not photonic integrated uh, components, but it's really photonic integrated computing, neuromorphic computing. But these are challenges uh, we will see, uh, say, for example, in the next 10 years coming up to us. So thanks for your attention. I need to, I want to uh, acknowledge also uh, the contributors we had to the chapter. And uh, if you want to contribute as well, uh, just feel free to send, to drop me an email, uh, to drop a mail to, to Rolf or Klaus. Uh, we jointly manage that trick uh, and we're always happy to get new kids, uh, new, new uh, contributors uh, in our group. Thanks a lot. So, so once again, you know, um, Tom Salmon, my boss, uh, is, is unfortunately unable to to join us, uh, you know, this week for the symposium. Uh, so I'll be presenting on 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 our behalf. So, um, anybody, if everybody can can see my screen, I can. I'll just move forward. Looks good. Uh, Thanks, Paul. Great. Thanks, Rachel. So, um, you know, we'll just quickly cover, um, you know, just the background and objectives of of the Twig. Uh, you know, I, I think a lot of the folks in in in, in attendance are pretty much are pretty familiar, but I think there may be some new ones. So it'd be good to kind of rehash some of the background and objectives. Um, I'd like to then, you know, kind of go back through some of the considerations that we we provided for the 2019 first publications, and and then pivot to basically, you know, some of the new discussions um, that have come up. Um, which will really pave the way for our uh, 2021 focus areas. And then definitely I'd like to spend some time uh, to acknowledge our, our, our working group members. So the way we see the, the supply chain twig, you know, to our understanding, there's really, you know, the past technical roadmaps that are out there have not really addressed uh, supply chain dynamics, you know, especially with the electronics, you know, shifting from the monolithic systems as we've seen in, in, in previous presentations. Uh, to more on the sense and compute, um, where certainly the supply chain dynamics are far more complex. Uh, and so this, this working group is, is focusing on, on the awareness aspect of things, as well as, you know, hoping to provide some guidance on checkpoint uh, for the industry when they are considering specific technical paths. The scope of this group, excuse me, will, will encompass the, the full supply chain, uh, but 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 with specific uh, focus on on HI heterogeneous integration, you know, obviously supply chain is a huge scope, um, but we definitely want to center that on on HI with with specific focus uh, to uh, you know responding to product application complexity, geographical and political diversity, supply chain disruptions, and supply chain development. Uh, within the team, we also wanted to recognize there's 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 a couple ways uh, to to really look at this, right? And so. You know, we want to look at it from from a package architecture standpoint. You know, you have your substrate base, multi-chip, wafer level packaging. Uh, we do recognize, you know, um, chiplets. So we even added that to our architecture. We did kind of debate which which bucket it really goes to, but we can certainly talk about that. But you know, that's that's a place that we we thought it would be uh, would put for now. Uh, but again, that's open for discussion later on. But we also certainly want to look at the application side of things. Certainly, you know, Rich talked about the, the automotive. I see some chats there as well. High performance computing, photonics integration, medical, and any other applications uh, that we want to have in scope. So just to revisit, you know, really quickly on the supply chain challenges that we outlined in the first edition, you know, we really saw this as, uh, you know, maybe three buckets. Um, one is the supply chain constraints. Uh, you know, for example, you know, within that category, we have our natural and human resources. I think Ajit talked about yesterday, um, if, you were, if you were able to join us yesterday on, on the lack of talent availability, um, you know, other industries luring uh, these engineers in, in, into, you know, in, into their world. And, and we definitely need to fill in that pipeline for the microelectronics industry. Uh, geopolitical, you know, certainly things like the US-China trade war, um, really come into play, you know, in, in, in your supply chain constraints, regulatory and EHS, uh, such as waste management issues, uh, continuity and resilience, certainly a term that, that has, you know, come into center stage, uh, you know, in, in recent memory. And, and then, you know, force mayor, um, earthquakes, flooding, disease outbreak. So, you know, certainly the COVID pandemic, you know, has taken center stage, but, you know, within the supply chain group, you know, we definitely want to look at it, you know, we want to take a step back, look at it in a bigger picture and, and say, and, you know, look at it through, you know, um, you know, apart from COVID, um, any other disease outbreak um, that we want to uh, take into consideration impacting your supply chain. 
Uh, the other buckets is, is also on uh, supply chain development. So basically, you know, we want to look at, you know, equipment capabilities for these new emerging technologies, materials, uh, the materials design. And then again, the environmental aspect by that, I mean, the transactional, the business models uh, and the innovation pipeline. So, you know, if you just kind of look at, you know, going back in, in, in recent memory or in recent events, if you will, uh, we just kind of wanted to, to provide a little bit of color uh, into these areas. So, for example, if you look at the U.S.-China trade war, you know, from the U.S. side of things, you know, we all know, you know, there's efforts out there to, to reshore U.S. manufacturing capability, um, you know, even, you know, from, from the front end, I see, you know, to the packaging side, we want to build capacity. Uh, and then to, to balance that, we want to have, we want to build that skilled workforce. So, you know, there's investments uh, um, to bring U.S. Uh, manufacturing back on U.S. soil, but also that education and training to grow the workforce uh, from STEM education, uh, to tech mentorship, to veteran programs. Uh, certainly, you know, from the China side of things, um, you know, we all know very well that there's, you know, invest investments going into technology and, you know, uh, efforts towards resource independence, whether it be talent or IP acquisition, or even, you know, creating a, a, a standards uh, infrastructure for domestic stakeholders. And, and, you know, with this dynamics, you know, also brings, you know, brought in, you know, other business shifts. By that, we mean, you know, other global players are really benefiting and, and they're seeing business growth. But nevertheless, we are also, you know, very much aware, cognizant uh, that some companies are still offshoring manufacturing to China. A couple of other, you know, examples, you know, uh, you know certainly Rich talked about the, uh, you know, the, the chip shortage, uh, the impact on the automotive, you know, we saw production cuts, uh, impact on vehicle sales, uh, job loss and furloughed workers. And, and, and certainly this is now rippling to other industries. Uh, and so you see that kickstarting or putting into motion, you know, basically uh, efforts or investments to build capacity due to the shortage. Uh, and then lastly, you know, if you look at it from an environmental or waste management standpoint, we're also seeing, you know, a lot of the, the shareholders, if you will, are, are taking on a more active role, uh, basically driving the management decisions where companies are requiring their supply chains uh, to be more green. And, and keeping their supply chain short, meaning less travel. Um, so there's less impact on the environment uh, and, and faster time, of course. And so you see that, you know, kickstarting investments, uh, mobilizing efforts to fund capacity expansion, not only that, but also for uh, pollution prevention measures. So, you know, given this backdrop, you know, uh, we, we saw our, our objectives for, for, for 2020 still is very much, uh, you know, um, more relevant than ever for the 2021 okay. outlook for us. Um, and so we want to look at, to, we can continue to look at supply chain dynamics, mm -hmm. uh, map that by package type and application. So for example, embedded dyes or wearables, um, look at upstream and downstream supply chains and other technology shifts. Uh, and then also, you know, keep an eye on the, you know, supply chain disruptions, both current and future, uh, you know, especially with that backdrop of the shift towards uh, uh, integration uh, and, and, you know, driving complexity. Um, we certainly looked at um, other, um, you know, neighboring twigs, if you will, and, and we saw some of, some of these twigs as um, perhaps our, our closest neighboring planets. We'd, we'd like to have closer co uh, coordination with them, uh, closer dialogue, but really, you know, with supply chain cutting through many different topics, we see ourselves interfacing with, with, with the other uh, twigs in the group. So last, I just wanted to um, um, say thank you very much to the, um, our, our members of the supply chain twig. I also would like to take this opportunity to welcome new members. Um, so thank you very much to the HIR leadership for, for helping bring some folks uh, into the team, uh, bring in additional firepower. And certainly, you know, some of these uh, topics, uh, for those of you who are, who are tuning in today, uh, you know, these are some of the topics that, uh, you, you know, you wish to engage or you know someone in your organization, organization who, who really should be engaged uh, in this team, definitely welcome um, their, their engagement. So. I think that's it for, for supply chain. So again, just a reminder uh, to please, uh, you know, um, um, use the chat function to, to have your, your, your questions um, in the, in the open, open, uh, open portion of the agenda. So, and, and that really brings us, um, I believe, to our last speaker, um, which is on uh, integrated power electronics. I believe we have Bob, Bob Connor. Okay, so the uh, integrated power electronics uh, twig uh, consists of the following members, and we showed each 
members' emails for follow-up. So the purpose of today is to uh, increase collaboration with the other TWIGs in order to uh, provide a very good 2021 update later this year. We'll be asking a series of important and challenging questions and then systematically follow up to then uh, flesh out answers uh, as we go forward. You know, so the first question is how to power the huge number of transistors that are getting integrated in SIPs. So, you know, the you know, SIPs will have um, many IP blocks, chiplets, high-end SIPs will also have high bandwidth memory, photonic integrated components. With continuous CMOS scaling, the transistor density becomes crazy high. The interposers are growing. Uh, in addition, uh, as was previously discussed today, there's a large number of uh, different workloads. There's uh, time dependent transients. You know, there's, it's all about powering the peaks. Uh, so how do you integrate and deliver power to these, you know, very sophisticated SIPs? So we're focusing on uh, integrated power electronics components. And, you know, this would be you know, ideally a building block or a family of building blocks uh, that then can easily be integrated in a wide family of different SIPs. So an IPEC is heterogeneous, consists of controller, drivers, power transistors, capacitors, inductors. Uh, the IPECs may be uh, repartitioned in different ways, integrated in multiple ways, each potentially serving different parts of hybrid topologies. Uh, we're pursuing two parallel efforts. One is IPECs outside of the SIP on the PCB. So this would be uh, a power module. And then the second would be integrating the IPEX inside the SEP, which is really the focus of today's presentation. So uh, the obvious candidates on how to integrate the SIP are A and load. And you can either do that with monolithic integration or hybrid bonding. B in the interposer. So it could be on the top side of the interposer. It could be integrated in an active interposer or embedded in an organic interposer or C in the substrate on the top side or the bottom side. Uh, so you know, the next important question is what are the performance metrics? And as Ravi said earlier, the challenge is suppliers at different levels of the supply chain speak different languages. Uh, you know, the goal is to have, you know, a few simple useful tables of performance metrics. Um, you know, so, you know, yeah, there's, it's non-trivial to, to define, you know, really what are all of those um, rows that should be included. It's performance, it's footprint thickness, uh, transit response is huge. Uh, and there's many different SIPs. Uh, with different requirements. And consequently, there's going to be uh, many different power IPEC performance metrics for these different applications. So uh, delving into where and how are the IPECs integrated, uh, what we did is we put hyperlinks to some published papers. So the first is you know, type A, integrate and load. And you know, Intel, has been doing this for uh, many years now with a fully integrated VR. So one approach is you know, monolithic integration of a power transistors, drivers, controller. Uh, and then you know, put the passive components uh, in the package. Uh, or the second is hybrid bonding. So hybrid bond, deep trench capacitors, uh, you know, integrated voltage regulators onto the load. So that's one approach. Another approach is uh, integrate the IPEX in the interposer. So you could either put it on the top side. So if you have an integrated voltage regular IVR or IPEC, the downside is then that consumes real estate, reduces 
the amount of top side for load. Um, the other second approach would be, oh, sorry about that. Uh, the second approach would be monolithically integrate in the interposer. And uh, CEA Levy uh, has published some papers on this in terms of the merits of uh, having an active interposer with uh, power conversion under each chiplet. And then uh, next approach would be embed an organic interposer. And uh, this then, you know, could really leverage, you know, the ecosystem's uh, implementation of uh, silicon bridge chips. So make an IPEC really thin, embed it in the interposer along with some integrated passive components, put it immediately under uh, the load. And then the uh, type C would be integrate in the substrate. So uh, again, if you put it on the top, top side of the substrate, so if you have you know, your load with a PMIC and inductors and capacitors, well, all of those IPEC components consume precious space that um, you know, maybe, maybe could be better utilized for load or put it on the back side. Uh, the land side, uh, and, and Intel's done this with the most recent uh, fiber where they put the magnetic inductor arrays on the uh, back side, but it needs to be really thin, high density. This could fit into uh, you know, some of the work that um, OSAPs are doing with double-sided mounting uh, SIPs. So then the next series of questions is, you know, actually, Who's responsible? Who does the integration? Uh, so, you know, the IDM's foundries uh, have really been spearheading this. You know, Intel, TSMC, uh, but the back end uh, suppliers uh, are not standing still. Uh, OSAT, substrate suppliers, uh, you know, both the front end and the back side are really moving into, you know, the middle end. So, advanced packaging, wafer level packaging. Uh, so the questions that we have for the other twigs, and again, we'd like to uh, embark on a systematic process is recognizing the different SIPs have a wide range of different performance, functionality and power requirements. First, you know, to, you know, try to get our arms around defining, you know, what the SIPs, you know, power needs are then delve into uh, what are then the specific IPEC building block performance metrics. Then uh, how are the IPECs integrated? And again, there's no one answer. There's probably multiple, you know, hybrid converters, you know, multiple stages, multiple implementations, but you know, some parts will be in the load, some in the interposer, some in the substrate. Who integrates what? Then once we have clarity on the performance metrics, then identify what new technology is required. And what we'll like to do is expand beyond just the other twigs, but also, you know, who else in the whole supply chain should we be, um, you, know, you know, discussing these questions with? And then what suggestions do you have in general? Because we wanna make the chapter 10 in 2021 as, as useful as possible for uh, the heterogeneous integration community uh, this is a big topic. It's an important topic. Uh, we really want to get our arms around it. So we've consequently on our twig uh, have a you know, divide and conquer strategy where uh, different members of our twig will be the point person to uh, our counterparts in the different application twigs. And uh, emails for each of us are on page two. And uh, so we look forward to the, um, you know, we're working with um, yeah, everyone in the heterogeneous integration community to really uh, provide some clarity, some useful performance metrics and technology requirements uh, going forward. Um, you know, Rich, you know, did you, did you have any questions? Uh, I, know, I know there's been a flurry of chats there kind of going on and I think uh, maybe some of those have already been addressed, but are there, are there any other burning questions from your end or are there any burning questions uh, from the other uh, presenters uh, for Rich? Yeah, um, 
so Paul, just, uh, I guess I'll ask one to you, you know, on the, uh, on the supply chain and specifically the automotive mm -hmm. supply chain side of things. And we talked before and, and, uh, it, you know, automotive, if you really look at it, it's historically been less than 10% of the semiconductor industry. So I think, uh, from an attention standpoint, it's not gotten much attention, although it is growing now. Yeah. Um, what do you think uh, your, your team could, your twig could cover related to automotive and in that space? And I understand the unique aspects of it with uh, the specialized tier one, tier two suppliers that serve into the automotive space. Um, is this something that you all could cover more or would you just kind of uh, pass it over to us to figure it out? Yeah, I, I think, you know, I think for, you know, we, we've given the supply chain twig because it, it does, it does, in, you know, span, you know, different, different topics, different architectures. We, we probably don't want to, you know, um, kind of um, lose the balance and, and, and have a very heavy section in automotive and, and almost kind of make a, a passing glance at the other ones. Mm -hmm. uh, but certainly we want to we want to mention that in, in our chapter. But what I was actually thinking, you know, Rich, you know, I think you and I have have had discussions uh, on another uh, semi semi group called the GAAC, the Global Automotive Advisory Council. Um, and, and, you know, certainly there's there's several um, uh, organizations, uh, you know, platforms out there on, on automotive where we see our, our positioning is from the semi GAAC is that, you know, with, with semi representing we're, we're, we're industry associations serving the market electronic supply chain, you know, where, where those two supply chains, where those two worlds uh, intersect, you know, we really see our, 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 our place there. Uh, and so that's how we've kind of positioned uh, the GAAC. So, um, you know, the, the conversations have been pretty revelatory from both sides. You know, we have we have OEMs, uh, you know, like VW, Audi, and Ford, and uh, in, uh, involved, uh, and then as well as uh, uh, tier one suppliers. And and you know, it's always a, a nice learning experience for them. And then similarly from from us on the on the semiconductor side. Um, and, and so you know, it's through these platforms where you know people get to you know you know, that, that dialogue is where people get to understand better, you know, the challenges, you know, I think there, there's been some, um, uh, some presentations or some uh, viewpoints out there, you know, where, where tier one suppliers were, were really surprised um, that it takes, you know, somewhere in the neighborhood from three to six to even uh, nine months, uh, basically from, uh, from silicon all the way down to a chip. Uh, in order for you know that that's how long it takes uh, to to get to to get to that point. So it's it's been an educational process. And so yeah, I mean it, it's you know there is that recognition about the ten percent um, kind of presence, but because there's been a lot of of um, kind of um, publicity or, or attention now, and then we have a forum, we actually see it as a way that it actually kickstarts the dialogue. Um, uh, even more. So I don't know if it really, you know, kind of talks to, you know, to your question there, Rich, but, you know, I, I think if anything, we, you know, we do have a platform uh, to have that. And, and then it's, so it's still a, a learning process and, and uh, you know, when, and basically leveraging that platform to come yeah, up and, with solutions. Paul, I, I understand that. And you, you gave me the opportunity to present at the, uh, I think the October meeting. So I really appreciate that. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I think there's in this in these days of COVID that the uh, interaction between new people <laughs> that haven't really met before, maybe uh, perhaps yeah. is still a challenge. So anyway, probably just need help in that area then. Absolutely. Yeah. And maybe just a, a, just one, one quick comment, you know, it's uh, I think, you know, it was been, we we're kind of tossing around, you know, the, the point that, uh, you know, there, there's there's the expectations that say what late q2 or early q3 you know we, we would be able to replenish the the, the supply um, but but we also wanted to look at beyond the shortage right and so you know what what do we want to do differently is there anything we can do differently so that we don't we don't get 
is this is this is this is this just a blip? Do we do we, we definitely don't want to look at this as just a blip? And how do we get our systems better? Okay. Um, and this doesn't happen again. All right, got it. I think my other question was for Bob, and uh, you know I'd had some discussions with Doug Hopkins and whatnot before. Um, you know, I think that some of the key developments in the areas of uh, some of these high power um, switches and inverters and whatnot really is in the area of wide, wide band gap materials. And I think uh, your chapter was covering at least a version of it that I had seen before anything was published. Is that, is that still the case, Bob, or are you, um, um, are you kind of limiting the focus really just on power supply to the uh, to SIPs like, I, like your presentation reflected? Oh, I mean, so my presentation showed uh, part one and part two. So part two continues to be power modules. So okay. external uh, heavy use of wide band gap semiconductors. And uh, then I think the new area that we're trying to add on to is uh, a part one, which is integration inside of the SIP itself. I see. So both are important, both are uh, parallel efforts. Okay, gotcha. All right, thank you. Hi, I'm uh, Shafi. Uh, I would like to have a question for Rich. So yes. Rich, I'm Shafi from the MEMS and Sensors uh, Twig. Yes. Um, I think uh, I liked your chart about different types of sensors that's used, uh, that's, or, or that's on the horizon to be used in the autonomous driving. And I think that's very critical in the sense that uh, 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 the, the multitude of phenomena, the so multitude of physical phenomena that it senses. Uh, I think it's a very good way to start the conversation with our team where what we would like to get some inputs on is how does that expand in terms of the REL requirements? What are the quality, I know quality needs are pretty much fixed, but if we take those multitude of different sensors, are they expected to have the same level of reliability or the battery of rel testing and how long the life and everything will look like? Because that's what is key for integrating the sensors in the sensor domain. Right. Um, so the sensors are all different as I think you highlighted, you know, whether it's an optical sensor, whether it's a, um, a LIDAR sensor using light um, transmission and receive, or whether it's radar using electromagnetic, electromagnetic waves. So anything that's semiconductor type related, uh, I do know that uh, just in dealing with uh, various uh, component suppliers in the industry that it's very much, you know, kind of along the standards of uh, comp component level reliability. When you get into some of these others, um, like LIDAR, it's, it's a different, it might be a different story. Um, and uh, I think that's um, probably ripe for a, a good discussion on reliability going forward. Of course, these guys are going to have to design their systems with, you know, a particular level of reliability in mind. The challenge on a lot of these new components that I've seen has always been, how do you define that? And who defines it? And it gets kind of done piecemeal to a certain extent. Okay. But I but I'm willing to, you know, we should put our heads together and and uh, we could connect with uh, certainly our our contributors and authors who contribute on things like these sensors, you know, uh, lidar and uh, and radar and CMOS image sensors and whatnot. Got it. Thanks. Uh, before I, uh, uh, I would like to answer, I think I got a question from Chris Bailey uh, in the chat. So I would like to just uh, talk a little bit about that. So Chris uh, uh, basically asked a question. Um, uh, it would be good to identify manufacturing and reliability challenges for MEMS in order to influence uh, the, some of the tools, the core design tools that we have so they can think about multi-physics requirements. Um, so Chris, uh, understand your question. I think uh, Mary Ann from our group or our twig uh, has started participating in your team. And she has mentioned about uh, creating a set of requirements 
uh, which will help you design tools or create a roadmap for what is needed in the tools. Um, so your point is well taken. I think we'll continue that conversation uh, as a cross cross uh, to participation. Yes, thank you. Yes, I see that crossing with the uh, reliability twig as well. I think there's some strong interactions we can have there. Um, uh, my, my question was the current tools that are used in, in MEMS, you know, what, do they need new capabilities, particularly across those areas? But uh, yes, thank you. Okay. Uh, but perhaps I start with uh, with a top down question uh, to to Rich and you. Uh, you mentioned the GACC or was it GACAA. Um, do you discuss at this point also um, challenges to the value chain? Meaning, uh, if you take a look to to some of the prospects we might see with big IT companies stepping in the autonomous driving market. Uh, and simultaneously, the trend we see in, in the Far East, as well as in Europe, uh, to keep cars out of the city, so in the, to reduce the, the individual traffic. Uh, for, at the first sight, this, uh, this would uh, raise my awareness uh, that perhaps at some point, uh, not anymore, the car manufacturers would be the ones to specify which components uh, they would like to see. But it would be more those service providers who say, uh, well, I need a module, uh, an ADAS module, module, for example, or an electric powertrain module. And uh, um, then basically who to talk to would be a completely different set than we have today. Perhaps you can right. comment on that. Um, maybe maybe I can take a, a first stab. So yeah, we, within the, the GAAC, um, Eric, so, um, how do I say this? So, so when 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 the when the community started, um, you know, just basically bringing bringing the 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 automotive guys and and the semiconductor guys together, um, and and you know, we, we started our our meetings with a lot of these, um, you know, getting to learn getting to know each other better. Um, you know, what are what are some of the challenges that the auto folks were seeing, and and what are some of the the challenges that you know we're seeing from from the semi side. Um, and and the education continues uh, continues to this day, um, and and the the whole education um, kind of period really spans. It has a pretty wide scope, you know. So we you know we talked about um, uh, you know th things like you know reliability, uh, you know, but we've also talked about you know um, uh, battery silicon carbide. Um, you know, what are, you know, basically, you know, what are some of the expectations, environmental expectations, not just hot temperatures, but also cold climates. Um, but, but, but we also get uh, a flavor of, you know, understanding the, the other um, standards that are already in place there. As I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of organizations out there doing things on automotive, uh, you know, you name it, obviously, you know, from, from, the, I, from the ISO, uh, standards uh, to board level reliability uh, groups uh, from ASTM, JDEC, you name it, IPC, there's a lot of groups out there. So understanding, um, you know, what, what the places are for those and, and, and not, um, you know, uh, duplicating or worse, uh, contradicting efforts um, among those. Um, but we also looked at things like um, the, the rollout or basically just the, the public adoption of, 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 of um, autonomous, autonomous autonomous driving. So by that, I mean, we had some folks uh, say from the city of San Francisco uh, or the city of San Jose, what are their challenges as far as infrastructure are concerned? Um, one of the stories that I, I remembered was, um, you know, um, when, when, when the city of San Jose reached out, you know, one, one of the, the thinkings there was, you know, they wanted to reach, uh, um, you know, basically more on the lower income uh, neighborhoods for them to leverage uh, autonomous, uh, you know, math, ma I'm talking about mass, mass, uh, mass transit, mass transportation. And it was kind of interesting that the, the thinking, you know, when they reached out to these local communities is that autonomous is still several decades away. Um, you know, the perception is that it's, it's something, you know, very, very futuristic. Um, and so just basically changing the public perception. So maybe, you know, if anything, that kind of gives you the, the, the scope. But right now, um, we've actually started to um, get some working groups uh, formed. Um, we, the, probably the most recent one is um, 
uh, reliability uh, uh, reliability of devices at, at advanced uh, nodes. Um, and so that's where you know the idea there is to look at you know what what are some of the the, the, the low. I think a lot of us get an, you know, have an idea what are the, you know, some of the challenges are for for devices, advanced nodes, um, but what is it that we can we can solve uh, in a pre-competitive environment? Again, this is within the semi construct, um, but similarly in 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 our in our Europe uh, chapter, uh, they're looking at uh, basically um, uh, it, it, um, interfaces between tier ones and OEMs and and uh, uh, semiconductor device makers. H how do you improve the communication flow within that chain um, so that you know trying to standardize as much as you can so that you don't have. I mean, it's that usual kind of classic scenario where you don't have these kind of one-off custom uh, um, applications. It's a lot harder, um, you know. It's going to take time, but but we definitely want to have the conversation. And so, um, maybe I'll I'll just close or at least kind of um, summarize it. But you know, we are getting these working groups uh, started. Um, I think we're come to the point that you know we'll continue the dialogue, but we're kind of done talking. Let, let's get some work. Let's get some work started. So yeah, I'd be happy to send some information your way and any others who's interested about that we're work the work that we're doing in the in the GAAC. Hey, Paul, I have a question. Uh, I've been um, chatting with someone on, on an attendee, uh, and it's related to traceability. Mm -hmm. um, I have not seen uh, the part in your chapter that kind of uh, relates to that. How in depth do you cover that as far as component level traceability? Yeah, you know, as far as um, I'm, I'm actually taking the notes too. You know, um, as far as the the supply chain twig, we haven't we haven't gone into the the traceability uh, side of things as okay. well, and so that's something to to take back to the team. Um, but within within Semi, um, you know, we we have a number of of activities uh, that that uh, are working on on the traceability. So traceability is, is certainly it's a very very broad topic. Or it's it, again, it spans, uh, you know, multiple disciplines. Uh, so we actually have a, um, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Semi, you know, we have many of these technical, um, te sorry, technology communities uh, that really serves different, uh, you know, focus areas. Uh, one of them is we call it the SCIS, Semiconductor Components, Instruments and Subsystems. And that group is also focused on, on advanced nodes. Although, you know, with the discussions that are happening, you know, people see that, we need this now, and so we're, we're taking into consideration current 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 implementations. But we're looking at uh, semiconductor component defectivities from the drums that hold your chemistries, your your chemical delivery systems, to your chamber components. Uh, we're looking at you know developing uh, test methodologies um, to help device makers uh, dictate you know what their contamination budgets are, defect limits, and so on. Uh, but one of the the groups there is on traceability, and so. Um, what, what they're looking at there is from a fab perspective. Uh, so say, you know, um, you're a foundry, you know, you're getting all these components and subsystems into your, into your shipping dock. How do you better track uh, these, these different components and subsystems coming your way? Again, with, with the mindset of, of traceability, uh, you know, there's, there's, you know, certainly traceability that's already been in place, but the, but the problem there is that it takes too long or you don't have full visibility of your supply chain, especially further up. Um, and so we, we actually, this group, uh, there's many aspects of it, but the first uh, standard that they're actually pushing through right now is on uh, part labeling. So how do you label, uh, you know, component systems, subsystems coming into your, into, your, into your shipping docks? Interestingly enough, we actually saw uh, that the automotive part labeling spec, the VDA 4992, was actually a good foundation for it. And so for the lack of a better term, we, we semified it. And, and actually, uh, you know, kind of porting that to uh, to semiconductor. The other topic is on how do you communicate uh, part quality? Um, you know, how, how good, if you will, is that part that is coming in that you're receiving? Um, so that's from the fab looking up your supply chain effort. Um, you also have another uh, activity. Um, this was under our cast group. So this was really more on the uh, test side. Um, you know, so we have folks like Dave and, and Ken uh, involved in that group as well. 
uh, but we had a we had a, a workshop a few years ago on um, uh, system level test, and what came out of that was uh, there's a need for device level level traceability. Um, you know, basically, you know, when you have a, a you know a single die or a multi chip module, how do you actually pinpoint that chip? How do you how do you um, call out that that location of that die so that you can trace back later if you have a you know an excursion or an issue. Um, so we actually published a standard on that. Um, and so you know maybe I'll I'll just conclude that you know there's um, within semi we're we're basically building this sort of this information super highway um, that 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 needs to be improved that way that you can communicate that you know from 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 your material side we actually have another group on the electronic material side was looking at at, at defectivity as well all the way down to your to your to your package device. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's a long answer again. Sorry about this. I didn't want to take up the the the, the time. But uh, yeah, it's it's something that we want to incorporate at least uh, pay you know give a nod to in, in the supply chain twig, um, and basically you know distilling all that activity into the work that we're doing there. Okay, thanks, Paul. Yeah, I guess my only question <laughs> is whether the automotive uh, electronic manufacturers are adopting the semi standard or they're doing their own thing. Absolutely, yeah, and, and and that's that's a challenge, right? And and, and that's probably a challenge for any uh, standards uh, developing organization. Is that you know it's it's you know when when we develop these specs, we def you know one of our um, guiding principles or one of our commandments is we need to get the entire stakeholders as best as you can uh, involved uh, because you know in in the end they're the ones who's going to benefit the standard uh, from the standard. Um, you know, and and so you know, a lot of that attention goes within semi, uh, but but the but the challenges or or what we're working to do is is that once the standard is done, is that we go back uh, to these uh, end users, whoever they may be, which part of the supply chain they would be, and say, okay, you know, you guys were part of the discussion, we did the standard for you, uh, with you, um, you know, how about you know you 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 kind of put your 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 money where your mouth is, or kind of let let the rubber hit the road. And actually put this in your purchase bag. So a, a lot of it too, you know, is basically pushing the customers for implementation. But but you can't necessarily you know shift the blame there because it, I think to what you were saying earlier, maybe Rich, is that maybe a lot of times they're not really aware that these standards exist because there's so many of them and there's so yeah. many from different organizations. So that's also another part of the responsibility that we we try to do is to let the world know that these standards exist to work with our counterparts and the other SDOs and say hey. These documents exist. Um, you know, let, let's let's trade notes and propagate the message. Okay, thank you, Paul. <clears throat> okay, um, so uh, uh, Paul, I'm Shafi. I have a question for Eric. Yes, please go ahead. So, Eric, uh, uh, curious uh, to know if uh, in your SIP and module uh, twig, uh, have you have an, had any conversation about how do you foresee or how do you see this challenge of sensors wherein they have to remain some kind of exposed or interact with the outside world versus the typical you know classical closed packages like molded or cavity based this is a very good point uh, in fact foreseeing yes but there is no general solution as of this uh, so you, um, it's actually a small notion only in the roadmap so far uh, that the industry has to look into uh, multi-domain uh, um, multi uh, uh, requirements, uh, including, for example, chemical sensing, uh, things being exposed, uh, where, the, where the sensitive surface needs to be directly exposed uh, to, the, to the sensing environment. Uh, and uh, this challenge is, uh, is pretty critical. There are already some potential solutions on the market for, for, single, for single sensor chips, uh, which eventually find their way already into the uh, fan out wafer level packaging. Um, but uh, there is no, not yet a, a clear roadmap aspect uh, of uh, how to tackle that challenge uh, in the future and uh, to what extent. Uh, so a metrics, uh, how much of these, how many of these sensor chips, how, uh, um, and uh, to sizes and, uh, and uh, uh, for example, process temperature constraints. There are a number of, of, of issues associated with that. There are 
just made aware so far, um, but uh, uh, as uh, uh, this might be a perfect opportunity to interface also with the MEMS and sensor trick on detailing out the requirements here. Great, great point, Eric. I agree with that. Okay, I, feedback accepted. Let's let's try to figure out how to collaborate on that one. Okay, do. Uh, maybe I'd like to give um, some time for for Bob. I know we're 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 getting close to the end of our session here. Um, Bob, just want to give you some some time. Um, you know, do you have any questions for the other twigs, or any other twigs have any questions for for Bob? The attendees as well. Feel free to enter them in the chat. Uh, yeah, I do have a question for Bob. Uh, this is Kanad from the HPC Twig. Hello, Bob. Hey, Bob. Uh, are there plans to cover uh, the requirement of uh, powering analog chiplets along with digital chiplets, power quality issues? And our second question is, is there any plan to cover new magnetics that can give you the form factor to be placed inside the SIPs? Uh, well, I, I think our general plan is to serve the needs of the other twigs. So uh, be as broad based as possible. I, I think you raised a uh, you know, couple of specifics that frankly speaking, I don't think we're on a roadmap or we're on our radar screen. Uh, yeah, perhaps they should be. Yeah, I think. I think the magnetics is in there. Um, yeah, we have uh, we have taken a look at magnetics on chip for both uh, power supply on chip and also for uh, uh, for for SIP in general. So some magnet passives are a big part of the integration of power electronics. So we have looked at capacitors and magnetics and uh, we'll continue to do so both in the part one, which is for the more distribution, control of distribution and making the power um, less noisy and, and reducing parasitics. And then also on the part two, where we're looking at um, developing uh, power supplies that are uh, separate, but, uh, but heterogeneously integrated themselves. Yeah, I, I guess the only other thing that I would add is, as I mentioned, this is I think the beginning of a collaborative process. So, um, just a heads up to the other twig, I expect to be hearing from each member of the power electronics twig uh, as a follow up to this. We look forward to working with you. Yeah, well, as, I, uh, oh, oh, as, Bob, as Bob mentioned in the last slide, he showed that we divided up the group into segments for direct in, uh, for direct uh, interface with the with the so called customer twigs, um, so that uh, uh, one or so two of us will focus on automotive and two will focus on high uh, density computing and uh, somebody will focus on defense and aerospace. And we wanna reach out to the twigs and get uh, some idea of the performance metrics that you need out of power electronics because if we get the performance metrics that you need, uh, we're then able to choose the technologies uh, or, or get an assessment of the technologies that need to be developed to meet those, to meet those needs. Okay, thanks Patrick. Yeah, there's one area that I want to add in the power electronics group is that uh, um, the linkage with materials, emerging materials. I think the um, one area that we need to have is to have passives. Passives has been an area of, um, passives has been an area of, uh, um, a very little research in terms of future materials. So I think this is an this is important for us. So Kanad, if you opened your opened up your smartwatch, open it up, and you will see that a huge area is occupied by passives. Right. Yeah. And uh, and we also would have to think about how to design the materials into the future. Materials take a long time. Right, you know, there's really good emerging work on printable um, new materials for inductors that can be put on the interposer and whatnot that have very high L values. 
Yes, there's a collaboration between the additive manufacturing uh, section in single multi-chip together with um, together with the uh, um, materials group in terms of just just exactly what you just said how to print the passives right this is doug hopkins too let me add in that there's other areas that we're not addressing yet uh size of the committee is how are we going to do power management at the sip level and is it the sip twig that has to look at how to actually carry the high energies throughout the package into all of the chips. So that has to be addressed someplace. All right, Doug, you know, we have just made a passing reference to that need in our chapter, but you know, we need to look at solutions. Well, I will suggest that you're not to be polite with each other. Don't say that it's your turn. I would say that if both of us jump in together, maybe it will be a yeah. fruitful collaboration. Yeah, the, you know, it will be certainly part of the discussions that Bob is going to have with the HPC twig. I, I think in general, there's a, it, it, the uh, interactions are at two or three different levels, but each of the twigs, um, not all of the twigs, but most of the twigs should have some uh, person that they are that that's taking on how they're what they're looking at their technologies are going to be also addressing power because I can see that on in some of the components some of the IPs if they're embedding power they have to use technology similar to what they're using to develop their 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 component yeah, good point so, Doug. absolutely flexible right. electronics and medical well you know wearables Right, and it's not that power exists as a separate component. If it gets embedded, you're going to use the same technologies to manage or to create converters and and do on chip conversion, etc. And then there's others you may have to expand a little bit in your technology to accommodate power. And then there's power by itself that may be sitting next to you or gets on top, etc. And so we need the twigs themselves to say, okay, well, how do I get power? How do I manage this power coming in? And then the power twig can say, okay. This is our. This is what we hear from all these other twigs, and what has to be common to that. And then, the, for instance, the SIP twig would come in and say, "Well, if we're going to want that kind of power delivered within the SIP, we need to have this kind of uh, discussion within within the SIP twig." Uh, I think that's where it goes. I think what you just talked about is a very important um, point, and uh, this is why we are having this. Um, conference, this is why we're having this uh, conversation with each other. It's a wonderful conversation because once you know, once you see other, well, it's just not really face to face, right? It is Zoom to Zoom. Once you see each other Zoom to Zoom, you said, oh yes, I can talk to him because I know what the Hopkins look like. I know what Paul Trio looks like and uh, and the conversation then can flow smoothly. Absolutely. Okay. And, and Bill, I think okay. we're 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 pretty much out of time. And so, you know, I, I just want to take a quick moment to thank again, you know, Rich, Shafi, Eric, uh, Bob, and the other, uh, you know, Twig leaders and uh, and the attendees for for um, for the open session.